Hello and welcome to the Freakish Lemon video podcast. I am your host, the Freakish Lemon. I go by Adrian and I use masculine pronouns. Welcome any new viewers. Thank you so much for clicking on whatever you clicked on to get here. Ignore the motorcycle. And welcome back any returning viewers. Thank you so much for sticking with me with this podcast. This is a crafty type things type podcast coming to you from the northwest hills of Connecticut. And show notes for this episode and all episodes will be found at my website at FreakishLemon.com or FreakishLemonPodcast.com. They go to the same place. We also have a group on Ravelry. Uh, just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab and you will find it. And you can follow me at all the fun places as Freakish Lemon, like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, and Ravelry. All the links to all these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you'd like to keep up with this podcast, uh, please consider hitting that little subscribe button, maybe even that notification bell, if that's something you're into. Um, I did not put the date in my show notes today. We're filming this on August 13th, 2017. I usually put the date in my show notes. <coughs> Pardon. Uh, yeah, I'm slightly out of focus. Sorry about that. We're getting off to a good start today. Um, yes, filming this Sunday, August 13th, 2017. And we start this podcast out with a bit of blah, 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 with a little bit of podcast related stuff. Two alongs that are currently happening. The 2017 Blanket Make-Along. Making a blanket at any point in 2017. There's a thread in the Ravelry group. All the um, chatter, encouragement rules and stuff are there. Uh, feel free to come over and check it out. And two is Sith and Spin. And I'll use that. Hello, Curtain. Welcome to the frame. Well, I guess it's just going to invade slightly over here. Wind. Also, door creaking. It's like... The environment is also agreeing with me that Halloween should be involved in everything right now. Um, what was I saying? Sith and Spin. Uh, I will use the intro later on when I talk about my spinning, but that is a spin-along that's going right now until the end of this month, so if you have not participated in Sith and Spin, Please head on over to Ravelry and check out that thread and put your entries in. You just have to spin and partake in Star Wars things. Watching Star Wars, listening to Star Wars audiobooks, listening to a Star Wars podcast. It's just spinning and Star Wars things. That's really... Hello, Curtain. Uh, that's really all you gotta do. Creaky door. Uh, you're gonna have to deal with the creaky door for right now, uh, because Penny has hidden her herself away upstairs because my parents aren't home right now. They went out to the movies and she's devastated. Um, but if she needs me, uh, I gotta have that door open. So it, it's gonna, you're gonna hear door creaking while the wind tries to blow it open. Uh, one more thing in podcast stuff. I'm gonna do a giveaway because I have an item sitting here that is in the prize bucket and I'd like to give it away. Um, that door. So what I'm giving away is this prize package, which was in a big box of stuff that I could either keep or give away for prizes um, that I didn't write down who sent it to me, but whoever you are, thank you so much. You know who you are. Um, so the main item in here is this skein of self-striping uh, Knit Mona yarn. Uh, Mona's favorite sock, which is a 7525 Superwash Merino Nylon in the colorway Satellite, which is grays and kind of a purpley gray and pinks and purples. Um, and then miscellaneous goodies that are in here. 
So in order to enter this giveaway, all you gotta do is go over to the thread that I will create on Ravelry. I have not, as of filming, created it yet, but it will be up shortly if it's not up currently. Um, go over to the thread and answer the prompt, what Yarny adventures or projects are you looking forward to in the coming seasons? Um, because right now, my brain is super excited for Rhinebeck. Because Gabby from Once Upon a Corgi, uh, who is my sister, and my mom and I booked a hotel room. So we're actually going to be up there for Friday stuff that's going on. And uh, we were going both days for the actual New York Sheep and Wolf Festival. It's a loud motorcycle. We were going to be going both days anyway because we don't live that far away, uh, less than two hours drive, so that's not a big deal, but we, we managed to snag a hotel room about 20 to 30 minutes away, so we'll be around for stuff and I'm super excited for stuff. <sighs> so excited for stuff. So yeah, uh, what yarny things are you excited for? If you're going to Rhinebeck, are you excited about Rhinebeck? If there's other festivals you're going to in the upcoming season, are you excited about those? Or are you just excited about working on a different type of project once the weather is changing where you are? Um, answer the thread and I will pick a person from that thread probably next episode. Yes. So quick little bit of life stuff, which is the next section of the podcast. Creaky door, creaky door. I'm going to point it out every single time. I don't even know if you can hear it right now because I might be doing some background noise removal because my laptop fan is loud. Um, so sorry if I keep talking about the creaky door and you can't even hear it. Uh, but that's a thing that's happening right now. So, life stuff. Um, like I said, we booked our hotel for Rhinebeck. We're su super excited, and, uh, yeah, we're just super excited. And we're getting all the dates for our other fall stuff, um, the Western Connecticut Yarn Crawl, the Coventry Farmer's Market, uh, Fiber Event, the New York, not New... New York Sheep and Wool Festival is Rhinebeck. Uh, the New England Sheep and Wool Festival. Um, Ren Fair planning, because we're going to the Ren Fairs later this year. Typically, in previous years, we had gone in August because of school schedules. But nobody's going back to school this fall. Although one of my brothers might be, but it's going to be not full time student school. So he's not going anywhere. Um, so yeah, we're doing Ren Fairs in September and I'm going to the New York Ren Fair in September and I'm going to the Pennsylvania Renaissance Fair in the first, the, the first week of October. Um, so very excited. All the things are coming up. There are so many things coming up. I'm so excited about it. Uh, other life stuff, my hands still improving uh, from my repetitive stress injury that I gave myself by being stupid. Um, work was exacerbating my hand issues this week because uh, there was a lot of repetitive motion stuff I had to do on the computer, which can just strain your hands anyway because you're there for eight hours in the, pretty much the same position at a desk being a computer monkey. Um, so that's been really annoying, but I'm still working on taking care of them and breaks and I'm really trying to work on my patience. Patience is not... Patience is very difficult for me if my brain is not being actively engaged, which is why I took up handicrafts in the first place. Like, I took up crocheting to start with because my brain was not engaged when I was watching things on TV that I wanted to watch. It was just not enough stimulation in my brain. So, 
trying to get over that brain impatience is really, really difficult because some part of my brain feels like it needs to be occupied at all moments of the day or else it will just die. Um, yes, so I'm, I'm working, trying to work on that so that I don't hit those times when I'm like, my hands are fine, ignore what my hands are feeling, which is, I think, really what happened to create the repetitive stress injury. So that's super fun. Um, that's a, that's a challenge, but I am working on it. Because <laughs> I really like to keep having function in my hands, that would be good. Um, and then the other thing I have bullet pointed, um, here for life stuff is an increase in puppy time this past week. Um, I thought I wasn't going to have a lot to talk about in this episode, but I'm looking at all the stuff over here and I have more than I thought, but I honestly didn't do very much crafting this week because my parents went on vacation. Uh, so my brothers and I were on our own here at my parents' house, uh, which meant lots of puppy time for me because Penny has her favorite people. I think many dogs do have, have favorite people. Um, so I don't know if it's, if it's just a perk, uh, not perk. Wow. Talking is hard. If it's just a quirk of her personality or if it's a thing with the breed, she's a Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Um, and I know Gabby's dogs get like this. I don't know if anybody else's dogs like get like this, but they have their people. Uh, and if their people are not around, it is puppy depression central. <laughs> so my mom is Penny's number one person because Penny is technically my mom's dog. So mom is number one. If mom is home, Penny is with mom. She might wander around to check on you because she is a herding dog. She needs to know where you are. Um, but if mom's home, she is with mom. But mom and dad went on vacation. <laughs> uh, I think dad and I are tied for number two. She tends to split her, her time equally between us if mom is not home. Uh, my mom works weekends every other weekend. So on those weekends where my mom is working, Penny splits her time between hanging out with me or hanging out with dad. Um, unless dad is in the kitchen having a kitchen adventure, because uh, my dad likes to cook as a hobby. So if he's cooking things all day in the kitchen, she's gonna spend more time with dad because he's in the kitchen and he might give her something. Um, but that's just common sense. So with both my parents gone for about four days, um, it was puppy time for me at any point I was home. That dog stuck to me. Uh, and she was so depressed when I was not home except for Wednesday when Gabby came up with, uh, Iron for her to play with. Um, I mean, she... She loves my brothers, uh, but she's not too fussed about what they're doing. If they're home, great, they're home. If they're not home, oh well, they're not home. She doesn't mope <laughs> when they're gone. Um, Cause I mean, my parents and I are primarily the caretakers for her. Okay, motorcycle, just slow down right outside my house for no reason. Thanks. Um, yeah, so it was all puppy time from the time from the time I woke up to the time I left for work and then when I got back from work to when I went to bed and then even then sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> although she held out for a while before she she uh, slept in my bed. Um, because usually she sleeps in my parents' room. She has her own bed there, but she switches between climbing up into bed with them uh, or sleeping in her bed. But for the first two nights, she did sleep in her own bed uh, overnight, but then she slept in my bed Wednesday night. 
that was too much of being alone. Um, so honestly, I didn't get that much crafting done this week. Apparently I got more crafting done last week than I had anticipated. Because I had to spend the whole time with Penny. Um, like I said, she's a Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Corgis are herding dogs, so they are high energy dogs. Uh, but my brothers, uh, when they're home, one of the brothers, he's not a dog. He's not an animal person at all. He'll take care of her, but he's not gonna, like, run around with her in the yard for an hour. Which she needs. Um, and then my other brother, if he is home during the week, he's working from home. So he's got limited break time. So it, it was me feeding her, me playing with her, me running her around in the yard, <laughs> me scuffling with her in the living room. Um, and then she was a depressed moping mess. So she was real high energy when I came home from work because she wasn't doing anything all day. Um, and usually when my parents are home, my mom's work schedule is such that she, she doesn't work weeks for a full five days. Uh, she's a nurse. She has her schedule set up, so she kind of does every other day uh, during the week um, working. So if Penny's having a low energy, a, a day when she's not being run around in the yard at some point during the middle of the day, it's only two, maybe three days a week. But that's what you have to take into consideration when you have a dog, so... <laughs> but because basically mom, dad, and I share that responsibility with taking care of her, and then it's all suddenly on you, like those those first days are tiring and you don't get to craft. <laughs> even though she, even though Penny would at 9 30 at night be down in the craft room like why aren't you crafting human? This is what you're supposed to be doing. Um, I'd be like uh, Penny we've literally just been running for four hours. I do not have the energy to spin right now. <laughs> and she'd look at me like I was the crazy one. But that's what's been going on with me. Lots of puppy time. Lots of trying to keep my brain occupied without necessarily using my hands too much. Kind of alternating hand activity, not hand activity. That's, yeah, it's been a long rambly segment. Boy, let's get into the craft stuff uh, before I ramble on too much uh, about Penny. <laughs> I mean, not that you guys don't love hearing about Penny. Uh, but this is a crafty type podcast. Let's actually talk about some crafty type things. So knitting stuff. I have, oops, let's not knock my computer over. I have a finished object this week. Amazing. Um, there were some days at work last week where my hands were okay to knit on a few of my breaks. So I was working on my Afterthought everything socks. Uh, no ends have been woven in. I literally finished these uh, probably an hour ago. Um, but yeah, these are my Afterthought everything socks. Knit on US Zero, two millimeter needles, 64 stitches, two by two cuffs, star toes, um, smooth operator socks heels. Uh, the black yarn is just some knit pick stroll that I have for heels, toes, cuffs, whatever. And the actual, this entire bit of sock is uh, Legacy Fiber Arts yarn. This was their colorway at the end of the, um, their kind of advent calendar thing they did last year that I split with my sister Gabby. So all this yarn is all the yarn I had. <laughs> Um, because I just had 50 grams of the yarn. Um, but there were, so the, the black toes are a bit bigger than they would normally be on my Afterthought Everything socks, but, uh, I used up all the yarn <laughs> for the long tube, and that's a great way to get use out of, if you have only, uh, a 50 gram skein, 
an afterthought everything sock is a great way to make use of the entirety of your skein because you just knit one long tube snip it in the middle separate it for toes and then snip it for heels so that's the whole skein those are my socks huzzah i finished a thing So now I get to talk about some works in progress for knitting, uh, and it's more than I had anticipated. I knew I'd be talking about one of these things, I did not know I would be talking about four things. Sorry, kicking the camera, tripods right where my feet are. So the first thing, the thing I've really been focusing on, is my Akiko sweater, which is a pattern by Regina Mosmer out of the Lion Brand Scarfy yarn. Sorry, show notes are over there. I forgot to mention that, so I'm just looking off to the side. Um, and that's a, an acrylic wool blend yarn on US 8 needles. All right. So, this is the sweater so far. This egg toast is where I was last time. So I've put a pretty big dent on this. In fact, I only have about an inch and a half of stockinette to go uh, before I do the ribbing at the bottom of the sweater and then I pick up for the sleeves. So that is very exciting. This is a definite Rhinebeck sweater. I'm hoping for a potential second one if uh, I can manage my time, uh, with a second sweater project, but that's very exciting. It's, I've tried it on, um, I put on a, a long, these are my Chiaogu interchangeable needles, so I put on a really long cable, and I tried it on, and it fits well, and I'm very excited about that. So encouraging, and it makes me want to nail all the sweaters ever, so... That's a thing. Um, yep. So I've also been doing some work on a shawl project that you haven't seen in many weeks because of prioritizing what my hands could work on. Um, but I needed to break from that sweater at one point because it was, you know, miles of stocking it in the middle there. So I needed to switch over and um, oh, this is a tangle. It's a tangle. It's very, it's at a very awkward point. Um, this is my Marled Magic shawl, which is a shawl by Stephen West. Um, and it's awkward because I have one cable holding stitches and one cable working stitches. So, <laughs> um, I'm in the second panel, basically. Um, I'm knitting this on US 6, 4 millimeter needles. So I've done the first panel, which is this kind of mesh lace panel. It's getting blown out in the camera. And now I'm on this second uh, seed stitch panel. And this is being knit with various bits of leftovers and hand spun. Some of my early hand spun is kind of the basis for this moral. Um, so there's a, a dark hand spun under here, there's a green hand spun in here, because um, I have all these weird odds of hand spun, so I might as well put them into something. It's kind of a goal of this year is to use up a bunch of the old hand spun that I've had just sitting around for years, years and years almost a decade some of this stuff so not huge progress on that but um definitely enough progress to to warrant a show on the podcast um and i'm really enjoying the pattern so far um it's i've only been working on two sections obviously but it's very simple once you get it set up what you need to do so your focus is really on your yarns and what you're playing with color so that's 
really cool and um, a good kind of um, get out of my head type knitting where I can almost focus on it kind of meditatively ish. Yeah, I, I know meditation and out of your head is not usually synonymous, but um, yeah, anyway, I don't know if I could explain. <laughs> Um, and then I've also put in a little bit of work on my Dwarven Mittens, which is in this uh, Jenna Rose Designs project bag. Um, the Dwarven Mittens pattern is by Ginger Monkey Knits. I'm knitting these out of Plymouth Homestead, Homestead Tweed in a gray color on US 3, 3.25 millimeter needles. And I finished the body of one of the mittens. I'll go back and do the thumbs um, once I have both bodies done. And fits my hand perfectly. I love this pattern. It's a really great cable pattern. Um, it's pretty simple if you're familiar with basic cables. And it just fits my hand so well. I mean, I have to put a thumb on it, which will require a little bit of adjustment to this part, but there's always a little bit of that. Um, but it's wonderful. And I've cast on the second one, but it's a teeny little bit of rib um, because doing the cables was hard on my hands while they were recovering. Um, but whenever I had a couple minutes where it wasn't going to make them worse. I put a few rows in on this. So that was cool. I think I'm going to put, put this in my backpack for work uh, for a little bit. So if my hands are okay at work to work on my breaks, kind of doing just a 10 minute bit of knitting on those cables. Um, it's kind of a good way to make progress throughout the week. So that's them, and I started a new project yesterday, <laughs> because Halloween is on my brain, guys. Fall, Halloween, that's all my brain wants right now. It's just like, like there's a breeze today, as you have seen by the curtain <laughs> floating into view, and my brain's just like, it's almost there. It's almost fall time. So, I started a Halloween show. I've done a Halloween shawl the past three years. <laughs> and with the way my hands have been going, this, uh, I mean, usually I've just kind of been working on it in October, but we don't know what my hand situation is going to look like in October. So I started it yesterday. Uh, after going to the yarn basket in Branford, Connecticut and getting some black yarn. I don't have it in my notes for, um, new stuff so it's I mean it's just I got three skeins of Barocco Ultra Alpaca in black <laughs> uh, and this uh, I'm not going to show you my project bag right now because it's a new one and I'll show it to you later um, and all the other project bags were either mine or I showed them to you so that's good uh, the pattern is Rice Fields by Lady in Yarn. It's a brioche pattern. I have played around with brioche in swatches before, um, but I had this yarn from last Halloween that I frogged from a Halloween shawl, and it wanted to be brioche because of who makes the yarn. <laughs> so let me just get these needles kind of out of my way. So this is the shawl so far. It's a teeny little shape. Uh, and the yarns that I'm using are Legacy Fiber Arts Halloween colorways. This is Mary Sanderson. This is Winnie Sanderson. And I've just started this green here, which is Spellbook. And uh, I know Chelsea from Legacy Fiber Arts has been a brioche monster. And uh, Sue's been getting into the brioche and loving it, so I wanted to do a Halloween shawl in brioche with their yarn, because it was talking to me that way. Um, 
I am really liking this pattern. It's kind of more of a recipe than a pattern. A little bit, but it's really well done and uh, put together really well and it's customizable. You can make either a half circle or a crescent shaped shawl. I'm going for uh, a half circle. I don't know if that'll actually end up happening because I always screw up shawls. <laughs> always. Uh, but my goal is to basically use up all the yarn and make this the biggest dang shawl possible. Big squishy Halloweeny shawl uh, that's reversible. So I'm gonna have because the way the, the shawl pattern is written is to use two colors and then you kind of switch the prominent colors. So you'd have, if you had black and white, you'd start with black here and then you'd switch to white and then you'd switch to black again. But I'm just doing these colors on the front and black on the back. but I'm having a good time with it. I'm gonna have a weird ends problem because of how I'm doing this, but whatever. I make blankets. Weaving in ends on a shawl is not gonna be a problem. I just gotta look it up how to weave in ends with brioche or study brioche very carefully as I go. But yes, that's so squishy. Um, yeah, I was working on that yesterday and it surprisingly does not give my hands as much trouble as something like cables. I, maybe it's just because of how I'm tensioning the yarn, because I'm not tensioning it very tightly at all for brioche, because it's going to be big and squishy anyway, and it's a shawl, so it's going to block out big. Um, but yeah, it was surprisingly easy on my hands yesterday, and purling's been hard on my hands lately. I don't know. Maybe my hands just want to work on Halloween stuff. Uh, and then crochet stuff real quick. I did start a new crochet project uh, because my brain is impatient and wants to start all of the things. I've got like two more blankets in the queue I want to start, but I have like five blankets going right now. Um, I just, I have all these little bits that are left over from various um, acrylic blankets and um, my scrap granny square uh, blanket project that's going on where I'm basically creating one color granny square is about this big um, but I have these are not big enough to make a full square and like I could use a couple of these greens to make some more squares but I just don't want to weave in ends of the same color yarn in the middle of a granny square that's this big. That's just, that does not interest me. Um, so I did a few granny squares with some, I have a big thing of gray and some little bits of scraps just crocheting over the ends, which is not the best way to weave in your ends with crochet, but I don't even know if these are going to become anything. I mean, I liked doing these, but I'm not sure I want to start another modular crochet blanket at this point. So I'm going to leave the hook, which is a USH 5mm hook, with these little scraps. And if I want to make more, I'll make more. If not, I've got a couple of granny squares, I guess. That happens sometimes with crochet. <laughs> you just make some, a couple of granny squares and you're like, oh, that wasn't what I wanted to do. I guess I'll do something else instead. All right, so that was really it for crochet stuff. Not a lot of crochet because again, aggravating my hands, but um, I mean, I put a smidge in on a couple of my crochet blanket projects, um, but not really a lot. So we'll move on to fiber stuff, which brings us to Sith and Spin. Sith and Spin. Sith and Spin. Got 
gotta love that intro. I love it so much. Um, I have a finished object for Sith and Spin. Well, mostly finished. I haven't actually set it yet, but I finished my lock spinning for my Cotswold, Wensleydale, and um, Mohair locks. Look at this big old thing of delightfulness. <sighs> yes. Um, if you're unfamiliar with lock spinning, uh, you're basically, when you shear a sheep, their, their fleece is clumped up into locks, and for um, breeds like Cotswold and Wensleydale and for the mohair goats, they basically form these kind of, wit like, they look like you cut a ponytail off of a toddler is what it looks like. Um, little wavy or ringlet type locks, and you just take those and you spin them. Um in a specific way so that they kind of retain um, the property of the locks so you get these little curly bits um, there's a good one you can have a little actually half of the lock just hang in there um, yes and this was spun for ha <sighs> my great hope one day is to do a cloak mantle um, like when, if you're familiar with Game of Thrones, uh, in the north they have these big fur mantles on their cloaks, like that, but out of block spun sheep locks. Uh, because I love the way these look when you, um, I don't know what that technique is called when you crochet them in, but you basically crochet them with long loops. So, because mine are overspun, they tend to twist together, but then they just kind of hang down like that in layers, and it looks fantastic. Uh, I have boot toppers that I made like that, and I love wearing those things around. Um, you'll see this thing here. Uh, this is some of that, um, I forgot what they call it. I've heard people call it highway tape. Flagging tape is what the Home Depot calls it, uh, and it's this plastic or vinyl tape that you can write on with a sharpie and it's waterproof. Um, I kind of get sick of filling out those tags for my hand spun, especially because I don't keep the tags once I use it. Um, so I'm going to start using, just write down the relevant information on these, that I, just that this lock spun. 234 grams, and then I'll measure the yardage once I wash it, because sometimes it shrinks up a little bit when you wash it. Um, but it looks so good just like hanging out in a big mass of <laughs> lock spun yarn. And it's so sheepy. It's delightful. So there's that. That's I have been doing more of my Cormo sweater spin, but I've put on maybe a quarter of a bobbin in the past three or four weeks so not a lot of progress that would be interesting to look at it's just brown cormo <laughs> but that's really interesting to look at this lock hanging out here one of the winsleydale locks i love it i love it that's my favorite part about spinning is getting to play with the fiber and kind of learn the properties of the different sheep breeds because they do different things when you play with them. It's so much fun. Uh, and then I've also been doing a bit more drop spindling uh, with the silk hankies uh, that were dyed by hedgehog fibers that my sister gave me in a D-stash. Um, I spent a bunch of time pre-drafting the hankies since silk is freaking indestructible, so I can, um, basically created these little nests, um, because the worst that's gonna happen is they're gonna stick to each other or something. Like, you can't accidentally draft these apart the way you can with wool, because the silk cocoon is just one big thread. It's indestructible spider 
like cobwebs is what it is. Um, so I pre-drafted a whole bunch just to go. So that's what that looks like. Um, I kind of prepped two different areas of the silk hanky. The way they took dye is different on either side. So there's a lot more pink and purple on one side and the other side is more blue and green. So this uh, spin started with a bunch of blue green and now I'm just kind of mixing up the colors um, so that when they apply together it'll be really interesting. But yeah, that's what that looks like. Still don't know what I'm going to use this for, but eh, worst comes to worst, somebody else will get it. That's really been it for spinning stuff. I wish I could do more. But time and hands do not allow me. So next we're going to go on to sewing stuff. And the latter half of this is going to merge into new stuff. Because um, I've got new sewing stuff and I've already started playing with it. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you um, is I made a project bag. <laughs> when I trimmed my Halloween quilt, my backing fabric for the Halloween quilt, it was a bunch of big panels of fabric that I had left over uh, instead of going to buy new fabric or a sheet to use as the back. I just stitched together big panels of scrap fabric that I had that was Halloween-y. And I always make my backing fabric absurdly larger than my um, than my quilt top because I know myself and I know that if I don't I will shift that quilt enough that they don't line up. I know that. So I play it safe and I had, at some points, almost a foot of extra fabric with the backing fabric. So when I trimmed the quilt, I had these big strips of fabric, mostly pre-sewn together, just in four pieces, um, that were kind of at a size where I would maybe not cut them down for quilt scraps um, into three inch squares or five inch squares or two and a half or one and a half inch strips, which is what I'm doing with my scraps these days. Um, so I just have a bunch of squares and strips ready for quilting. So I took the four pieces and I sewed them together into a big rectangle and I made myself a drawstring project bag. <laughs> See, this, this one, that's the closest edge that was to the quilt. These, look at how big this is. That's, that was on one side of the quilt. That was on one side of the quilt. This green was on one side of the quilt. <laughs> like... So yeah, so this bag is made out of um, the leftover ends of my quilt uh, and then just a plain off-white muslin probably on the inside um, and I did it as a drawstring uh, so that I wouldn't have to fight to find a zipper um, and I didn't really want to play with a zipper. And I had these little strips left um, in my strips stash. So I made little drawstring channels. And this drawstring is actually leftover quilt binding. Uh, my one inch uh, bias tape, I just folded it in half, ran two lines through the sewing machine, folded the whole thing in half, cut it, so then I had two drawstrings. It's all Halloween scrap except for the inside. So now I have a nice big shawl and or sweater bag. Um, especially since I'm getting into sweater knitting, I need more large bags because I'm a broad shouldered person. I make larger sweaters. Um, so now I have the Star Wars duffel bag, the Avengers sweater bag, and this Halloween sweater bag which I'm loving right now and it has my Halloween shawl in it and then 
here's where we start to blend into new stuff. Um, when I'm not t-shirt and jeansing it, uh, I have, I like to wear button down shirts. Um, especially for like cas casual Fridays at work, it's good to have a button down shirt to go over jeans. And I like dark colors, which you've seen me wear. And um, for button down shirts, I look ridiculous in short sleeve button down shirts. It just, it looks weird on me. So I wear long sleeve shirts and I roll up the sleeves to the elbow. And it's impossible, apparently, to find a size large, lightweight, cotton, button down shirt in dark colors with long sleeves. It's so hard to find them. Just like casual ones. Like you can find dress shirts, but not casual ones. It's ridiculous. And it's like a fight to find two or three shirts every couple of years when I wear out the other ones. So Joanne Fabrics was having an anniversary sale and I picked up some shirt patterns. Uh, I picked up this Simplicity 1544 men's shirt pattern with four styles of button-down shirts and this McCall's M6044 with four styles of button-down shirts. I mean, I'll never make the short sleeve one because like I said, my they just look weird on me. Um, but yeah, so I went and I got shirt patterns. And for sewing over the past couple weeks, I've been creating my my size version of this pattern um, using Swedish tracing paper. Because those those tissue paper th these tissue paper patterns, I destroy them. I always rip a piece in half. It always happens <laughs> if I try to use them on fabric to cut out my... And then I always get the lines wrong trying to cut out my size. Like, I don't cut out my size in the tissue paper patterns, but I try to trace out my size and I always get it wrong and it's just a mess. Uh, I have sewn garments before, but not everyday garments. I'm a costume occasional sewer. Um, but I've been getting into the quilting lately, and quilting looks very difficult. It's not very difficult once you get some practice under your belt. So now that I've, I'm confident in my basic quilting ability, I, I'm much more familiar with sewing machines and how they work and how you piece things together, um, that I'm going to give making some shirts a try. So, this one's on the back burner for now. Um, and I'm starting with this one. This is actually just going by um, the pieces and the design of the shirt. Um, this is actually the more difficult shirt because this shirt has um, a yoked back with a, I don't know, it's gonna focus like a yoked back with a little back tab, uh, which means there's more things to be pieced around the shoulders, which is kind of a troublesome spot if you're not used to making garments. Um, Cause that's been a troublesome spot for me in um, costume making before. But, I bought two fabrics and the easier fabric to work with is going to be with this shirt. So I'm going to do the easy fabric with the hard pattern and then do the hard fabric with the easy pattern. And that'll make more sense in a minute. But I've been tracing out uh, this pattern on Swedish tracing paper. And this is, this is also going with my trying to instill some patience in the brain, trying to occupy it in different ways so that my brain doesn't try to murder me out of boredom. 
Um, so it's been kind of slow going because I've been really taking my time and I finished cutting out the pieces today. They're a little bit folded because they're so big. But um, yep, just trace them out on my table, slowly, carefully, <laughs> carefully cut them out, made sure I had all the things for my size. Um, and then I've put the tissue paper patterns away in this envelope. This is how I'm organizing my patterns now, by the way. I reorganized them last week. I just bought a big box of these envelopes and I put up here what the pattern is and what's in here. So for my other patterns, I just have um, the tissue paper, so it's just the details of what the pattern is. But this one, I'm, I've put it that it's the master pattern, so it's the tissue paper one. And these will go in a separate envelope for um, specifically my size um, for a specific um, shirt style. Because I'm going to be making the B shirt with the A pocket. I, I'm not sure what the cuffs are doing on the A shirt. It, they look the same here in the drawing, but they're... Like, they're weird on the A shirt. Like, the B shirt looks like a pretty normal shirt cuff. Um, but I do want that pocket. So that's what I'm... That's what I'm doing with this. Um, hopefully over the next week I'll be able to... I've already pre-washed my fabric, but I need to, like, iron it. <laughs> and, um, get my pieces laid out to cut out the fabric. Uh, which, more acquisition, new stuff, uh, my fabric. So, oh, there's little bits from the laundry. So this is the fabric I bought to do this, um, more complicated shirt. It's just a gray cotton fabric, um, already covered in dog hair. I overestimated the yardage and got three yards. The pattern calls for... For 45 inch fabric, and this is 43 inch fabric, um, calls for in my size two and five eighths yards. So I just rounded it up to three for insurance. <laughs> if I really screw something up, it's not likely I'll particularly screw up the big pieces, it's gonna be stuff like the cuffs or the yoke, or the collar. So I've got extra fabric. And I quilt, so it's not like that fabric's just gonna go to waste. It'll be in a quilt someday. So, just a, a gray cotton for a shirt. And then I also got this kind of navy and red and white plaid cotton. Like I said, more difficult fabric for the easier shirt because this shirt, if you look at the little diagram pictures, it's just a straight back. There's no yoking on the back. I don't know at this point how much pattern matching I'm going to do or if I'm just gonna wing it. Um, I actually have to look at my plaid button-down shirts and see how much pattern matching the company that I bought these shirts from does. Because um, if they don't do a heck of a lot, I'm not going to worry about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, that's going to be this shirt. Um, I might not do pockets for this shirt. Um, I don't think I, I necessarily need to, since this is a pretty busy fabric. Um, I don't particularly use the pockets, but I feel like a plain gray shirt would look weird without a pocket. I don't know. Weird thoughts about men's clothing. Um, but yeah, so I've been slowly working on this shirt. Slowly. But carefully, so I don't screw it up. 
because that that is a problem that I've had with sewing things in the past is I get the the prep takes so long that by the time I'm sewing it I just want to full speed ahead and then I screw up and I go whatever and then I don't like it <laughs> soon down the line because I made all these mistakes that were easily fixable by not rushing so working on that brain patience and then I've got I had a knit picks order I, I say that like it just happened to me no I put in a knit picks order uh, for a couple of projects that I wanted to talk a little bit about um, as kind of a upcoming projects type segment because the yarn itself is not that exciting it's it's knit picks wool of the Andes sport weight yarn um, but the projects I'm really kind of excited about so I bought a sweaters quantity in this hollyberry color and this um, dove heather color. So this is going to be a sweater. This is going to be a Christmas sweater. Yes. Because I don't have any Christmas sweaters. I don't. And, uh, yeah, my notes say I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it because, uh, there's few things in my life I love more than this particular mashup. And if you've watched this podcast for a while, you know what that mashup is. And that, that mashup, the mashup between Star Wars and Christmas, I have an unhealthy uh, affection for Star Wars Christmas things. I have gotten the Star Wars Lego advent calendar for like the past six years. <laughs> I own the Christmas in the Stars album where droids are trying to help Santa's workshop get Christmas underway for the galaxy. I have watched the Star Wars holiday special the one time one day when the trauma is less real, I'll go back and watch it again because I am a rewatcher, but oh wow. It felt like four hours. It was like, I, I don't know how long the holiday special is, but it feels like four hours and your brain is slowly melting out of your ears. Um, but yeah. So Star Wars Christmas things. I am making a Star Wars Christmas sweater. I am. Anyway, so I got a sweater quantity of yarn for that. And then I got, it's actually more yarn than the sweater's quantity. It shouldn't be, but it is. Like in my brain, the com it doesn't compute that way, but it is. And that's, again, Wool of the Andes Sport Knit Picks yarn. Um, the green is Aurora Heather, and the, the this is Dove Heather again. And, um, more fandom things. I've been <laughs> somewhat reluctantly dragged back into the Harry Potter fandom by Dead Cat with a Flamethrower, who uh, wrote the fic Swung by Seraphim, which I talked about on the podcast several episodes ago, and the, her current ongoing fic of a linear circle about um, Severus Snape and uh, Salazar Slytherin's younger brother, Nizar Slytherin, who was a portrait in the Slytherin common room, uh, but it turns out he wasn't really a portrait at all. He was an actual person transfigured into a portrait uh, until the time came that Hogwarts would need a protector and he turned back <laughs> to a person. And Harry Potter's mysteriously disappeared. It's a delightful fic, but it's dragged me kicking and screaming back into Harry Potter fandom, which I had phased out of. Harry Potter's a wonderful series. I will say that. The first four books are some of my favorite books. I was disappointed by latter books. Um, 
and frankly find a heck of a lot of fan fiction more exciting than the last three books of the Harry Potter series. Um, disclaimer. <laughs> but. Flamethrower has dragged me kicking and screaming back in there. I'm You've noticed more Harry Potter fanfic recommendations in the past few episodes. I've been reading more Harry Potter fanfic. I've gotten to a point where I can do that again without feeling angry about the last three books. I don't know why I'm suddenly Italian, but... <laughs> anyway. When I was first learning to knit, I made myself a Slytherin scarf. Because I am a Slytherin. That is truth. And I don't trust the Pottermore sorting nonsense. I've taken that three different times and been in three different houses with the same answers. So. So. No. Tried to put me in Gryffindor one time. Are you kidding me? That's not me. Slytherin pride. So I have a Slytherin scarf. It's a very old Slytherin scarf, made entirely of acrylic yarn, and it was back at the time when I did not know that you should not knot your work and snip it real close instead of weaving in your ends. So some of those knots have come undone and I've had to do some kind of Frankenstein putting it back together. And it's just, it's not something that I actually use these days um, because it's falling apart. It's acrylic, so it like sticks to you if you get sweaty. It's, it's not, it's not in great condition. It's not really going to hold up. So time for a wool Slytherin scarf for my Slytherin pride. My reluctant Slytherin pride. <laughs> oh, Harry Potter. Can't escape you. Apparently. And I have one more Yarny acquisition. The first uh, skein of the Once Upon a Corgi Edgar Allan Poe Club is out there in the world. I don't know how long ago she mailed these out. She dropped it off at the house when she brought I run up to visit with Penny this past week, so I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to do like I did for the series of unfortunate events. Tell you about the base, tell you the name of the colorway, tell you to look away if you don't want to see it, show the yarn, and then tell you when you can come back. So this is actually on a different base than what she's been doing for the series of unfortunate events. Um, this was done on the Oliver base, uh, the Superwash Merino single base. Um, and the name of the colorway is Tomorrow I Shall Be Fetterless. And uh, she actually includes um, basically a card with um, which Poe story and or poem that quote is from, which is very cool. So in just a moment, I'm going to show you the colorway. I'm not going to say anything about the colorway. You can just look at it in silence or look away until I tell you when you can look back. Okay? Okay. I'm gonna show the colorway now. And the colorway is no longer on screen. I'm very pleased with that. That goes on the floor now. <laughs> um, and then I have one more acquisition I wanted to show you. It's not a yarny acquisition. Um, knitting folks have been either rekindling or initiating a new love of en enamel pins. I feel like I'm not saying these words correctly. Um, hang on one moment. Yeah, car pulled into the driveway. I had to wait until people came in the house because 
this window is right where the front door is. <laughs> so yes, I was saying, um, podcasters are either rekindling a love of enamel pins or getting into enamel pins. And uh, I had bought a couple of enamel pins, so now my Etsy feed is like, maybe these pins? Maybe? And I stumbled across um, this Etsy shop, uh, Hope Sick. You can also redirect to their shop by going to hopesick.com. Link will be in the show notes. I just pointed to my computer. And they had these enamel pins, and I just about lost my mind. Um... Oh, they're being reflected. There we go. Ish. Uh. <laughs> they are McDonald's chicken nuggets Halloween pins. <laughs> In my Googling what years they did this for their Happy Meal toys, um, because we used to get them in the early 90s. We still have a bunch of them that we put out on our windowsill as decorations. Um, every Halloween. They're some of my favorite Halloween decorations. <laughs> but I guess some of them went as far back as the 70s, but they stopped doing them in the mid-90s. And it it's such a shame, because I love the, the Halloween chicken nugget toys. Like, if they brought those back, I would buy Happy Meals at McDonald's at least once a week to get different chicken nuggets. So there's the pumpkin chicken nugget, the Frankenstein chicken nugget, the witch one, the Dracula one, the ghost one, and the mummy one. So I bought these as a set uh, because it just pinged my 90s Halloween nostalgia. And then I also got this guy. And if you don't know who this guy is, this guy is horror from The Page Master, uh, which is a movie about a boy who basically goes on a quest in a magical library with the help of some books, uh, horror, adventure, and fantasy. <laughs> and horror was a coward because he, he was horror. He was frightened of everything. Everything was scary because his whole world was horror fiction. Oh my god. I put it on my gender rolls or dead bag. <laughs> but, um, I might just, like, wear these on my shirt collars at work. Uh, all through October. Because I love them so much and they need to be shared with the world. Halloween chicken nuggets. If I remember correctly, this set is from 1992. Um, because they had specific costumes for the Nuggets for certain years. I want to say this is 92 when, when, and we have all of these <laughs> in our house that we put up for Halloween on the windowsills. <laughs> I love it. I just had to share that with you. For any other enamel pin enthusiasts, if you need some Halloween pins, go check out Hope Sick. They have some great 90s nostalgia Halloween type pins. Like they have Are You Afraid of the Dark pins. They have Beetlejuice pins. Um, they have the uh, Frankenberry, Boo Berry, and the other one that I never remember, cereal pins. Uh, <laughs> they're just really, really great, full of 90s nostalgia. And they have All Real Monsters pins nearly spent another chunk of money on those. I came this close. Lots of motorcycles. Okay. But, but that's it for new stuff. Slash sewing stuff. So real quick, we'll go through s quick. Blah, 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 blah. I'm unable to speak. Real quick, we'll go through some other stuff. Stuff I'm listening to. I started one new podcast from the last episode. It's uh, Spines is the name of the podcast. And the summary is uh, two months ago, Ren woke up covered in blood, suffering from memory loss, and surrounded by the remnants of some strange cult ritual. Spines is the story of her search for answers and the deadly powerful people she encounters along the way. Um, I'm liking it so far. 
it's not one that I'm binging um, quite so much as the other ones. Um, but, but I am listening to it steadily as Ren tells her story about searching for people that she might remember or doesn't really remember and running into different powerful deadly people and uh, what happens to them and what happens to her and that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty good. Um, it's not immediately grabbing my brain, but I don't know if that's just me not listening to this at the right time for it to grab my brain or if it's just something that's not grabbing my brain. Uh, but I'm gonna keep listening to it and uh, see how I like the whole thing. I, I'm close to finishing season one. Um, yeah. But definitely worth a listen if that's something that interests you. And stuff I'm watching, still watching Game of Thrones, uh, which I'm really enjoying this season. Um, and I finally started Sense8 Season 2. Uh, when it came out, uh, Season 2, my brain just wasn't in the space to be watching TV shows, I think. I think I, I like, wasn't watching TV shows at the time when it came out. That happens sometimes, um, but now I'm in it. I think I'm four episodes in. I am enjoying it thus far. Um, I really loved season one. Um, and it's a, it's a different season because of where their focus is. But I am enjoying it. I'm having a good time with it. And then stuff I'm reading. I finished Heir to the Empire, which is book one of the Thrawn trilogy, written by Timothy Zahn and narrated by Mark Thompson. That's been my Sith and Spin book. And I started today uh, my second Sith and Spin book, Dark Force Rising, which is book two of the Thrawn trilogy <laughs> by Timothy Zahn, narrated by Mark Thompson. Um, yeah, I'm having a good time. A lot of this is familiar, and I don't know if it's because I've read these books and forgotten, or if I've read so much peripheral material around these books that all of these characters are just familiar to me. <laughs> it's kind of hard to pick those out because, especially when I was younger, like uh, 11, 12, I would just read any Star Wars book I could get my hands on. So they weren't in order. They could be in the middle of a series. <laughs> so it's entirely possible that I've read some of these books before and it it's just been lost in a sea of partial Star Wars series books. Um, but I'm really enjoying them. Thrawn is a freaking great character. I'm loving this part of Mara Jade's life. I know I've read books with Mara Jade when she's kind of more further along her personal journey to figure out who she is and what she wants to be doing with her life. Um, but this is a really interesting time for her. Um, Mara Jade is a Force-sensitive woman who was basically raised to be a tool of the Emperor. She was his hand, so she was like a secret... like a secret Darth Vader. <laughs> like she would have had a lot of power if people knew that she existed, but she was kind of off the records and she would do missions that the Emperor requested personally. And when the rebellion was victorious over the second Death Star, she had nowhere to go because she wasn't a part of the Imperial infrastructure and nobody knew about her who was still alive. So it's a really interesting time for her in this book because she's conflicted, which makes for interesting storytelling. Um... And then I started listening to the Edgar Allan Poe audio collection. 
which is a bunch of Edgar Allan Poe poems and short stories narrated by Vincent Price and Basil Rathbone, which are great. <laughs> the only criticism I have of this collection is they don't give you titles at the start of each story. You know when a new story is starting because the narrator switches, but it doesn't tell you which story they're reading. Some of them it's pretty obvious to get which ones they are right off the bat, like The Fall of the House of Usher, that's in like the first line, um, The Mask of the Red Death, pretty, pretty easy to figure out that one. Uh, I could pick out The Telltale Heart out of <laughs> A Shot in the Dark, uh, because we used to read that one a lot in school. Like that was always the one that came about around Halloween, is The Telltale Heart. Um, but some of the other ones, I'm not as familiar with them, and they don't tell you which ones they are. So mildly frustrating, but I suppose, you know, if I really needed to look it up, it wouldn't be that hard. Because it's Edgar Allan Poe. Really easy to find his stuff. That's really all I've been uh, reading, just kind of audiobooks. Because the fanfic sucked me in, because now I've got Star Wars fanfic and Harry Potter fanfic, and it's been many years since I've read a Harry Potter fanfic with any sort of regularity, so there are probably a decade's worth of fics to delve through since I last delved through them. No, my god. Fanfic. So this episode's fanfic recommendation is a Harry Potter fanfic, and it is another long Harry Potter fanfic. I'm finding I'm really liking big Harry Potter fanfics. Um, big alternate universe Harry Potter fanfics. Are we surprised by this? No. But there, there's a lot of cool things to explore with alternate universe Harry Potter fanfics, because you have at least seven years to pull from canon. At least. Especially now that the series is complete. Um, yeah. So the fic I'm going to be recommending is actually a series, because um, there's the Hogwarts years, some interludes, and the after Hogwarts years, but um, I'm just gonna give you the title of the Hogwarts years, because it's a huge fic and I love it. And it does some pretty really cool things. Um, and the After Hogwarts years is still ongoing, which is very exciting for me. <laughs> so the name of this book um, is called Harry Potter and the Problem of Potions by uh, Weist, W-Y-S-T-E. Summary for this fic is, once upon a time, Harry Potter hid for two hours from Dudley in a chemistry classroom. While a nice graduate student explained about the scientific method and interesting facts about acids, a pebble thrown into the water causes ripples. Contains, in no particular order, magic candy making, Harry falling in love with a house, evil kitten Draco Malfoy, and Hermione attempting to apply logic to the wizarding world. Alternate universe Harry Potter fanfic. It's not... Oh, my battery is running low. Oh no! The premise is not all that different from the canon Harry Potter series. Like, it's a thing with alternate universe fix to sort him into a different house, or he makes a different group of friends, or something happens during one of their misadventures and, like, radically changes something. The only thing different at the start of Harry Potter's going to Hogwarts is he sits in that potions classroom that first day of class and even though Professor Snape is the, you know, the worst teacher <laughs> in terms of being amenable to students, Harry Potter opens up potions textbook and goes, yes, <laughs> potions is amazing. And just like stubbornly sticks with it. He's like, Snape hates me, I hate Snape, 
but I love potions, so I'm gonna create my own Snape filter in the back of my mind and just like ignore all the mean stuff that he's saying and pull out the relevant information I need. Which eventually changes how the two of them interact, which changes how he interacts with other people because he's got this weird Snape filter going on in the back of his brain all the time and he just like stops being able to recognize when people are mean to him. Like, he can recognize when people are being mean to him, but it filters through a different set of parameters than Harry Potter, as you know, in the books. Like, he eventually becomes friends with Draco Malfoy because he runs Draco Malfoy through the Snape filter, and what he's getting is, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, <laughs> instead of, wow, this kid's the worst kid that I've ever met in my life, except for my cousin Dudley. <laughs> like, it's- he just puts things through the Snape filter. <laughs> and just kind of gets to the heart of what they're actually trying to do here. Um, it's a really great fic. The- the friend dynamic- like, he's still best friends with Ron and Hermione. And he's also friends with Neville a lot earlier on. And his relationship with Ginny evolves slightly differently and in a way that makes more sense narratively, um, to me anyway. But then he also develops this sort of mutually antagonistic friendship with Draco Malfoy. And by extent, Gregory Goyle, because Goyle's got it in his head that Draco is his best friend. He must protect him. He's a tiny, fragile little boy. <laughs> But he's not very smart. Um, and this fic reveals that he's not very smart because his father does, doesn't believe that reading is beneficial in any way and that you must memorize everything, but neither of them are particularly good at it. So it like changes Draco's interactions with them, although Crab is not. He's not really down with this. He's hanging out with Draco because his father says he has to. But Goyle hit, has this, like, loyalty bit in his brain where he's like, I must protect Draco Malfoy. He is my best friend. I shall push Harry Potter down the stairs. <laughs> Harry's just like, why is this happening to me? Um, it's so good. And the best part is, is Harry doesn't have any particular skill at potions. The way that Hermione's skilled at everything or that Snape is skilled at potions. He's just very stubbornly fascinated by potions. <laughs> very stubbornly. Very stubbornly. So stubbornly that other people are confused as to why he's like voluntarily getting himself into trouble for extra detention from Snape where he actually learns things. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. I can't even describe exactly... It's a, it's a very strange relationship that Harry Potter has with people who were portrayed as enemies in the original books. Like, even his communication with Voldemort is... is, is weird. It's, it's a lot more nuanced than the books are. Because, I mean, they're, they're books created for young adults-ish slash children slash whatever. I mean, there's there's always going to be more nuance than you can, that you can add to books. It's really, really interesting and really fun. And um, it does some really cool narrative things where because you're already familiar with the original books, there's some parts that the author will not skip over, but shorten radically to just a couple of sentences because you know how it goes in the books. So they're just gonna tell you what's different or like a different outcome of this interaction. Like the author puts like, in another universe, Harry did blah, 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 blah. In this universe, <laughs> he spent the whole night in detentions with Snape grading first year's papers. Like <laughs> it, it's, it's really good. I highly recommend it if you're a Harry Potter fan and you like exploring different possibilities when you change things about Harry Potter's life. It's super great. And now my computer is uh, dying. The battery is dying. So I'm gonna sign it off now. Um, 
show notes and everything are over at freakishlemon.com or freakishlemonpodcast.com. Uh, come join us at the Ravelry group. Uh, just search Freakish Lemon in the groups tab. Come join the blanket make along. Come join Sith and Spin. Come enter for giveaway of the sock yarn that I've thrown across the room to make room for the second part of this podcast. Um, come follow me as Freakish Lemon at all the fun places like Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Ravelry. Tumblr, especially if you're into fan fiction and Star Wars. Um, links to all these things will be in the down bar here on YouTube or somewhere around here if you're watching this somewhere else. And if you are here on YouTube and you'd like to know when I post new episodes, consider hitting that little subscribe button if you like. It's an option. So that's going to do it for this episode. Goodbye.